Welcome to America F1, and we do our Singapore review show with Scott stepping in for Paul. Paul's a little under the weather today, and we talk about the Singapore Grand Prix. We talk about Lando Norris domination, led every lap, had a pole position, which he finally converted into a win. His first one of his career, and this was Lando Norris's third win of the season and of his career. And it was, even though he won and he led every lap of the race, there were two <laughs> big mistakes where he could have just botched the whole thing. When at one time Lando was 30 seconds ahead of the field, 30 seconds ahead of Max for stepping. Amazing. Let's get into it here at America F1. Yeah, America F1. America F1. It's a golden run. America F1. Scott, you're dressed up in all your McLaren gear today, buddy. You're looking good. Watch, buddy. You're looking good today, man. <laughs> What you get when you talk about Lando Norris? Lando Norris, well, the eighth time was a charm, right? He <laughs> finally, finally started from pole and finished the first lap in the lead. He finally got that demon off his back. Unbelievable, but true. <laughs> what do you think of, you know, there was that time where he basically almost bent it right into the wall twice because mm -hmm. he was fastest lap every lap and he didn't need to do that no. and don't you think that's what like the greats like you're ahead 20 seconds just bring the car home just bring the car home turn the you engine down, coast on it he wanted to show the f1 world that the roles are reversed mm. that he is now dun 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 max oh. first lap and no. no he's he not he wanted to show the world that when oh. he has a dominant car He's uh -huh. going to put an old-fashioned ass whipping on the grid. Okay, and that's exactly what he did. The problem is he's not Max Verstappen. He makes he's very fast, mm -hmm. but he makes mistakes with the dominant car. And he came really close to bending it. And if he didn't have that massive lead, uh, he would have lost the race because he 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 almost hit the wall. <laughs> I agree. I think if if he was getting pressure for twenty laps, he would have went into the wall for sure. But but he's fast. Uh, there's no question. He's got pace, uh, and he knows how to drive a race car fast. What he what he doesn't quite have is that robotic, hurt. You know the, the the scary consistency that Max has when he's got a dominant car in his hands. That Lewis had when he had a dominant car in his hands. That Michael Schumacher had when he had a dominant car in his hands. That's the difference between an excellent driver and a multiple world champion. Like I yeah. said, Lando hasn't proven me that he, he he's multiple world champion quality. He certainly has shown the world that he's real fast and that he has talent and that he's super quick, which let's, he was. I mean, he about, was uh, Sebastian Vettel, I mean, when he had that dominant car, I mean, he after the first lap, it's like goodbye. Like Vettel, like they wouldn't even show him on the broadcast because he'd be so far ahead. And that's yes. what the greatest – the greats do. Like, he's an excellent driver. I love Lando. And maybe he'll become better with time. But but interesting stat that you wanted to bring up about the points. Oh. <laughs> I mean, what was that again? Oh, sure. Well, uh, I guess he is now 52 points behind Max for mm. uh, P1 in the Drivers' Championship, which I believe is the exact same margin he was at Miami. Uh, except the difference is, since Miami, he has had unquestionably the most dominant car on the grid, and Max has had a pretty crappy one, one that's been anywhere from the second best car to the fourth or even the fifth best car. But somehow Max, because he is Max, because he's probably the best driver on the grid currently, I think he is, uh, whether you're his fan or not is a different question, Mm -hmm. But Max has somehow managed with some, you know, great pit stops, great strategy, and great driving to stay in the fight uh, when another driver might have been, you know, really collapsed 
uh, and Max somehow manages to pull it out uh, to, to stay in the fight. Uh, Lando, I think if either Lando or Lewis um, had the McLaren car uh, since China, not China, but post-China, since Miami, they probably would have posted of those 13 races, nine or 10 wins uh, to Lando's three. And, that, and that's what you have to do. You have to have, when you have a dominant car, you have to run off like seven, eight wins in a row. Like, like look, look, look at last year, 24 races, max won 21. Huh? Yeah, 21. No, no. Red Bull won 21. Uh, max won 19. Right. And Max won 10 in a row. Yeah. Did he? Wait. So the other people who won, who won what? Uh, Checo won two. Checo Carlos won two. Won. Carlos won one. So yes. Red Bull won 21 races. Max won 19 of those races. Now that's being dominant. That I mean, right. the, he, he had the most dominant car in history, of course. But And he, and he also probably had a little um, cheating going on that they didn't report. But that's okay. Max but, Verstappen had, in my opinion, the greatest season of any F1 driver in history. I think his performance was otherworldly consistent. See, you can take any driver on the grid, put him in that RB19, they'll win two to four races because it was that much better. Right. But to win more than eight, nine races, to win 10 races, to win 12 races, to win 14 races, 19 races takes an otherworldly talent. Only a couple of drivers in F1 history would be capable of that level of consistency. You're talking about a Max, a Lewis, a Schumacher. But Max, when he has that dominant car, just had an otherworldly ability to bring 100% performance every week without going anywhere near the wall. And Max has 331 right now. And, and, Lando Norris has 279. And with the remaining races, I mean, I'm pretty sure Oscar mm -hmm. Piastri is going to win one or two of those. And Max probably maybe. Win, maybe win a race or two. And then somehow, you know, you know, they'll make sure George wins a race or two. <laughs> but well, that track was so dusty and windy and did you see the little like dragon running around on the track? Oh, Larry, Larry the lizard. Yeah, yeah. I, I did. He, his, his legs move pretty fast. By the way, do not, and I mean do not, rule out my boy Charles Leclerc to win a race. Oh, we're gonna get to we're gonna get to Charles. I mean, we're gonna get to you know, and I, I should take the time to uh, say that you should. Like, let, let's put up our like, subscribe thing before we get, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification down there so you can be informed when we have a new episode up of America F1. And Lando, look at this picture. What a, what a spectacular picture. I love that. And it, with, with the fireworks, and I actually love the delivery this week because Typically, I'm not. I don't really like the papaya livery. I'm not a big fan of it. I like the old McLaren silver when Lewis was driving. I love that one. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, it's too busy. There's too many. They have so many. <laughs> they sponsors? have sponsors on that car. They look just. You know what they look like? They look like. Have you ever when you watch truck racing and like NASCAR's truck racing part series when the guy comes to the interview and his shirt is just full of sponsorships and he has a hat on and there's you know, a sponsor there and he's wearing glasses and he has a sponsor on the side of the glasses. That's what the papaya McLaren looks like to me. Yeah. You know, it's just too, too busy. And I hope they bring back mandatory liveries. All this carbon, carbon fire has to go. It's, it's, it's not a good watch. It doesn't show up really well on TV. And then when you're there at the race, I mean, they go by so fast. It just, does, it's not a good look. Bring up up the weight limits. Let these, you know, because Red Bull, they got rid. They had a special livery for Singapore, and they got rid of it because they said it was too much weight. And they did. Yeah, well, they're they did. they're trying desperately to, to keep you know to keep the World Drivers Championship in Max's column, and every single point counts, um, as we certainly found out at the end of the race. <laughs> every single. 
counts. Every second counts. Every advantage that they can get counts. And Red Bull, Red Bull plays to win. They don't. They don't. They don't mess around. And now that yeah, that's right. We have to every, talk about every Red go. Bull. Why don't you give me your take on? the interview that Max gave when, when they're sitting in the, the cool on room for qualifying and they were talking doing the press conference and Max was given like one word answers. And he was saying, you know, this is not toward you as a, you know, an interviewer or as a press person, this is something else. And what was that something else, Scott? Oh, to Tom Clarkson. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you know, Max got, uh, sentenced to community service by the stewards uh, for saying that the car was fucked up. He's just uh, so funny to me. In the, he gave an interview after Quali and, you know, Tom Clarkson was asking him a question, basically, how's the, you know, how's the car changed? And how's it different? And at one point he said the car was fucked up. He didn't say a person was fucked up. He didn't use an ableist slur. He right. like Yuki got sanctioned for, he didn't use any racist names. He called the car fucked up, which it frankly has been. Right. You know, the Red Bull RB20 has fallen off a cliff since China. Uh, it went from being the dominant car to a mediocre car. Mm. Uh, and he was right. It is fucked up. And, you know, these these TV news conferences are not played live, by the way. The, the, the FIA news conference uh, for the Quali is never played live. It is edited and heavily edited and anything he say that is not for children can be beeped out, can be bleeped right. out. And nonetheless, uh, they decided to uh, to sanction Max, which I, I thought was ridiculous. Uh, on Experiences XO, we did a poll of fans and uh, the overwhelming majority of fans thought it was ridiculous because it is <laughs> ridiculous. Um, obviously, if Max had used um, you know a racist remark, a sexist remark, an ableist remark, um, you know, the FIA might have been more uh, justified in doing that. But to sanction a driver for using a four-letter word talking about his car, um, this is a, this is motorsports. This, uh, this isn't nursery school. I thought it was ridiculous. Most fans thought it was ridiculous. And you know, frankly, the FIA has better things to worry about, like, you know, maybe how should it protect drivers um, after they crash? Mm. Uh, you know, in in uh, in IndyCar, if you crash, they have a thirty-person AMR crash response team with four vehicles that 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 immediately races to the site, gets that driver. The driver can't walk back across the track like they find Carlos twenty-five thousand euros for doing. You right. know, when there's one medical car, that's it, and they have to rely on locals to hopefully do something. You know, focus on that. Scott, I'm protecting their drivers instead yes. of screening them because they used a word. The protection Ridiculous. of the driver should be paramount to the sport. But not only that, you have one medical car going by and you made a good point. They leave up the medical response to each track. Right. FI Formula One is a multi billion dollar business. Right. Spend some money. Make sure that the drivers and the fans are taken care of. Because sometimes you, you get these crashes and they go into the barrier and parts of the car fly into the audience. I mean, I've been there. I remember I was in Canada one time mm-hmm. and Lewis Hamilton off off the one straight. He, he mm-hmm. comes. There's a big runoff of dirt and it, he crashed into the barriers right in front of us, like right in front. Mm-hmm. And part of the car flew off and, you know, went into the audience. And I was thinking, OK, they have like a chain link fence, but sometimes you can have that chain link fence and you can also have like the baseball netting a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, like in baseball. So then these type of things that fly off the car won't harm, you know, the audience, but to take it a step further. Yeah. Why are you skimping on safety? We have the halo, right? Okay. So now we have the halo before we didn't have the halo. So why are we skimping on safety? Why are drivers still crossing the road? Like yeah, because there's no crash response team. Well, first of all, there's no mandatory rule in F1, as there is in like NASCAR, that mm-hmm. a driver must stay, if there's no fire, a driver mm-hmm. must stay in their car until the crash response team gets them. And the reason they do that is because if you crash, your brain, even if you're not physically outwardly hurt, your brain experiences sudden deceleration. 
and you're not and, and a huge rush of adrenaline and you're not exactly in your right state of mind right away necessarily you get a little bit of a flight or fight or flight response right and that's why indycar nascar physically takes custody of the driver puts them in the car and takes them back to the pits in the garage whereas an f1 you're sort of on your own you know okay the locals are there you know, they're the maybe you in a scooter. He go in the back of a scooter. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, a, it's a it's a joke. It's ridiculous. And they're focusing in on Max calling his car fucked instead of protecting their drivers. Yeah. When the sport is awash in billions of dollars of money, when they could spend a tiny little amount to get a dedicated crash response team with multiple vehicles, like they have in sports like NASCAR and IndyCar, which don't make a fraction of the money. And don't have nearly the prestige right. that Formula One has. I don't get it. I don't but get we it. want to focus on bad language from drivers in and press conferences that are taped. And jewelry. And jewelry. I don't get it. I I, I think but I this I haven't read or seen this anywhere. And this is my take. I think President Ben Suleiman, who was a former Red Bull driver, like mm-hmm. at the GT level, mm-hmm. he wants to be a Formula One driver. He's always in at, at every race. He's always taking pictures with the drivers. He's shaking their hands. I mean, at every race is the. Who, do you even know who's the head of IndyCar? I don't. Do you know who's no. the head of IndyCar? I don't. But he wants his name out there. He wants to be seen. He thinks he's a celebrity, and that is the problem. I don't want to see you. I don't want to know you. Come out. Do your job. Make sure these drivers are safe. Make sure the fans are safe. And give me a good experience for the money that I'm paying to see this sport. As far as Max went, the best thing he did, in my opinion, was he basically, he answered one question at the beginning. And then he uh, gave one word answers and then said his voice was was a little bad. So he couldn't yeah. really answer. And then he held an impromptu press conference outside. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't let him stand and talk. They said, oh, it's against the rules. So he held a walking press conference with the drivers because they couldn't stop him from doing that. He held a walking press conference with the reporters. Mm -hmm. And he sent a very clear message to the FIA that if you mess with me and other top drivers, we can still talk to the press without you. We don't need you to do that. Um, And it also sent a very nice, nice message that, you know, look, if you do that to those of us, we don't need you all that much. Like maybe you should stop. And I, I think in that moment, you know, if you saw all the comments on social media, I think in that moment, whether you're a Max fan or not, 95% of the F1 fans were Max fans that night. 100%. I, so here's the thing why I'm starting to like Max a lot more. One, I always like people who speak their mind. That's just because that's who I am. I, I'll let you know. Who I'm standing. Anything. Uh, and, you know, and I'm a truth teller. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm just going to tell you how it is and the truth. And if you don't like it, well, that's not my problem. I'm telling you the truth. That's okay. Him. If you want somebody to go lie to you, go talk to that guy over there because he'll lie to you all day. But right. if you you want to know the real thing, come talk to me and I'll tell you. And what I appreciate about you, Scott, is you have a lot of inside knowledge that a lot of Formula One fans don't have. And that's why we have you on the show. And Really, going forward, we'd love to have you as a permanent part of our show because you bring something to the table. And I just so much appreciate the information that you have and the enthusiasm because I have the same enthusiasm. Like, I love this sport. And I want to see these drivers safe. I want to see the fans that go to the race have a great experience. Like when you go to Austin, it's, oh man, the first time I went to Austin, remember the first year they had it? They had a fan experience downtown and they have something similar in Monaco, like up on that hill, there's a fan experience that's away from the racetrack. And I love that. And sometimes you go to some of these races and there's nothing. No, it's just race. And we'll be uh, we'll be actually in Austin, mm-hmm. and we will be back with our favorite team or one of our two favorite teams to attend races with. Uh, one of them is our friends at Aston Martin. Oh yeah, 
is uh, where we're going with our friends at Scuderia Ferrari, Forza Ferrari. So we will be oh, man. You know, I in, in, the club, you. in the Ferrari Formula One club with Scuderia Ferrari. Did I tell you I joined the form? I mean, the Ferrari club just because Lewis is coming next year. So I joined because they no. join the Ferrari club. They send you out a packet and everything like that. And I mm-hmm. want to get that first Lewis packet. So I, I joined and I've been <laughs> wherever Lewis goes, I'm going. And I, I'm almost like sad. And I wish before we uh, keep moving on, well, let's just get right into Lewis. Yep. I'm sad that all the Team LH fans. Who, and that Team LH, for the fans out there, that's what they call Lewis fans. Their Team Lewis Hamilton. Mercedes has built up all this goodwill with Mercedes Team LH fans. And yep. he's been there, and he's won eight championships for this team. Constructed. Yes, yes. And they're blowing all that goodwill just this year. Just because he's leaving and... I think that all these coincidences that are happening on his side of the garage, a la Rosberg 2016, Mm -hmm. is unconscionable. You can't get the blankets to heat the the tire temperatures up, and it only happens on Lewis's side. Okay. All right. Right. Okay. He's trying out all these different setups. And he didn't have to do that years before, but George is supposed to be the lead driver now. Why isn't he trying all those setups? And then you put on a wrong part, so then you have to redo the engine. He has to start in a pit pit lane, and then you put him on the wrong tires. He doesn't start on the hards. He starts on the medium. And then here we go. In this at Spa, you don't tell him that George is going to do another. Um, he's only going to do a one stop, and maybe Lewis could have picked up time or done something different. You don't tell him that. And then in this race, you start them on scrub softs. Scrub soft. They're not new softs, Scott. No. Scrub softs in Singapore, where the degradation of the tire is heavy because it's so damn hot. Everybody else is starting on mediums, but you start the guy who qualified third because you think for some reason he's going to be able to get Max for stepping into the first turn in a very short <laughs> There's a short run to the first turn, which it's makes it extremely difficult. And so now you've convinced this man to put on scrub sauce, and you think he's going to pass Max, who he would rather crash than you pass him. So give me a break. You know you're, I mean, let, they act like they don't know the history of Max or Stepin. Do you really think he's going to pass on the first Max? It's not going to happen. It's, it's just not going to happen. Oh, Scott, help It's me. interesting. I mean, he's definitely, um, he has certainly complained almost, you know, he, he's, there have been definitely times where he's inferred that he has been sabotaged um, by somebody or something, that the tires weren't right, that the temperatures weren't right, um, the strategies haven't always been right. You know, occasionally and miraculously in Silverstone, his home race, the strategies were right. The temperatures were right, anyone. Um, but the strategies have largely been pretty poor with him. Uh, for some reason, very often, uh, his amazing performances sometimes in the practice rounds seem to disappear, or on Friday seem to disappear on Saturday when it's quality time. I'm not sure why that is, uh, but you know, it it does seem coincidental. Maybe it isn't coincidental. It's troubling that that seems to happen uh obviously his win in spa was a fluke he wasn't supposed to win george was supposed to win and but then he was a couple of pounds underweight because he couldn't uh pick up marbles because there's no in lap at spa because you go right into the pit exit uh instead of doing the in lap because it's about seven kilometers around as you know or you may know i i do know the spa track pretty well i drove three days there which we'll talk about on some episode with manti racing uh with in gt race cars but um, but as far as you know, on the other hand, I'm like, does Mercedes can Mercedes really look at sponsors in the eye and say without really potentially getting sued or being in breach of its contractual agreements, we're not earning as many constructors' points as we could be with our most famous driver, and we're 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 just going to put at risk essentially positions in the constructors' championship and prestige. You know, Toto is such a corporate guy. I can't imagine he would do that 
because he is very legalistic. He's very formalistic. He's very sort of Germanic in that sense. You know, he rules oriented. I'm not sure he would do that. Uh, I, the coincidences are very troubling. I just don't see Toto doing that because he is very contracts and very rules oriented. And I'm not sure he would do that. I, I think he'd be too worried about getting sued by some of the big sponsors. You know, what, what, what I look at is they're doing all these coincidences to a 39 yeah. year old driver. And why does George need all this help? If he's so great and so fast and he's going to be a leader of your team, which it looks like they're having second thoughts about because, you know, we, we all know they're trying to get Max. There why does he need all this help to beat Lewis? Why does he need it? I mean, he doesn't. He got destroyed by Lewis last year. He was getting beat heavily this year by Lewis, but they keep helping him. And to have a split strategy, well, let's talk about split strategy. Usually you put the guy who's in front on the better strategy. You split yes. the strategy with the guy in the back. You don't split the strategy, the crappy strategy, for the guy leading. I've never seen that. It's always That's the guy correct. who's behind. So yeah. in this case, they yep. did it the lead driver. That don't make sense to me. No, no, correct. You would, you would have put, absolutely. You would put the guy in front on mediums like everybody else, and put the guy who is trailing on softs in the hope that there'd be a safety car that you know that maybe the guy gets a few positions on the you know on the first lap, and then there's an early safety car, and then he can go on to the better car, right? With a cheap pit stop. Yes. No question. I and, so they, and so, and so you would do it. Even my 13 year old said, Dad, what are they doing putting him on soft tires? And they're not even new soft tires. And I said, Son, it's so George can get ahead of him. <laughs> I said it right there. I said, Son, it's so George can get ahead of him. And we all know it's true and it's sad. And you know, one of the best things that I've seen, Scott, and I don't know if you've seen this, is this right here. So Lewis is, this is after qualifying, you know, yes, they're really, and this is, look, and all the Team LH and to all the Max Red Bull fans, these guys don't hate each other. These guys are very professional. They talk to each other. Stop all the Lewis hate. Stop all the Max hate. These are two great drivers on the grid. Enjoy them while they're there. Okay? Yes, it's not, not going to last forever. It's not going to last. We got all these young guys coming up. We got Kim Antonelli. And now we got Franco. Look at this segue. Franco Calampinto. What an impressive guy. I mean, I a Franco fan. If you're not a Franco fan, look at me. I am the captain. No. If you're not a Franco fan, I don't know what sport you're watching. That that dive, as Alex Albon said, on the first. I mean, on that first. What is he doing? Is what he said. He said, no. It's a dive bomb move. What are they doing? What's he doing? What's he He's doing? A racing driver. What's you haven't doing? had one your whole career at Williams. You've been <laughs> across the garage from the two worst drivers in the history of F1 in the last five years, Nicholas Latifi and Mike and our countryman Logan Sargent. Sorry, sorry. But there are worse people, not people, but the worst drivers, two of the nicest guys, but the worst drivers to drive an F1 in the last five years. And other, other than um the, the, has not to look like has gotten to look like Senna by comparison. Wait, wait. Other than the, the guy from Russia, though, he was pretty bad. Uh, the oh, guy. you're right, Nikita Mazepin. Ma yeah, Mazepin. Ma Sorry, he was he was really bad. Well, <laughs> you know, it's not every driver who gets a website built to him. You know, saying how long how long has it been since Mazepin has spun? Has spun. <laughs> he was the best. He, I mean, you know. well, at least he gave Schumacher at least another year in the sport, probably. Huh. He gave Mick Schumacher probably another year in the sport. You got to give him that. But, you know, this really like, calls into like play, is Alex Albon really that good? Because, I mean, I think he's a good driver, but Franco, did you know that he was, let's see, he was less than seven thousandths of a second I know. in qualifying. Like It was 130 to 474 to 134.61. And, and there's a big end there. And what didn't Franco have on his car that Alex's car had? Do you know? Uh, modifications. You're kidding. Oh, yeah. 
Alex's car had a suite of suspension upgrades that made the car better and more aerodynamic. And Franco had none of them. So if you take that out, Franco beat Alex for the second race in a row because he beat him at Baku. He outqualified him at Baku. If they had the same mods, he would have outqualified him again in Singapore. I, Frank is the real deal. Holyfield, baby. Yeah, he's the real deal. And he, mm -hmm. I hear that they're leaning toward, um, I mean, I love Bottas. He's my guy. I love him. Yeah. I, I hear they're leading, Sauber's yeah. leading to him. That's what the news says. The unconfirmed well, that, that, that Franco's out and he's probably just going to be a reserve driver somewhere, but some right. has to happen. And this is what I'm going to, I'm going to, here's my scenario. Okay. Perez, got to go. Perez goes, if you put either Liam Lawson or Yuki, I think Yuki deserves a chance. Kim, Never get him. I know he's not, but he deserves it. So say you, you don't, don't get him. So they then put, like Liam Lawson, put Liam Lawson in that seat, bring Franco, Colin Pinto, and put him up against Yuki. And that's the best of both worlds. We got a good young driver on the grid. And Perez, he's had his time. He, I love him. The Mexican fans love him, but it's time. It's time. We all know it. It's time. If you're going to get rid of Danny Rick, then yep. come on. You mm -hmm. got to get rid of Checo. I think so. But I, I think they're going to promote Isaac. Hadjar. If, if Hadjar comes in one or two in F2, mm -hmm. I think they're pretty, I think they'll probably promote Isaac Hadjar, uh, who's doing quite well in F2, but somebody with the kind of performance Franco is, is, is having, unless he blows up in the next six races, someone's given him a seat because not only is he proving to be a really good racing driver, the dude is sponsor gold. Sponsors are flocking to Williams. He is handsome. The fans love him. He is super telegenic. He's got a ton of Santa-like charisma. He's got a lot of charisma. And he's a really aggressive, talented racing driver. He's getting a seat for 26. Yeah, he may have to do an Oscar Piastri one-year reserve driver gig because it looks like Valtteri's getting a final year, but somebody's signing him for 26. He's just too good, too handsome, too likable, and too much charisma. To not get that seat because he has that yeah. extra there too. Yeah, he does. And all the interviews I've seen him in, he's very composed and he actually gives a good interview. He's not a one word answer person. He actually thinks about what he's saying and he actually gives a little depth to his answers. And that's what I, I mean, that's PR 101. He's actually knows what he's talking about and he gives the fans a little bit more. Not like that damn Lance Stroll who's a wet noodle when they uh, ask him a question. Matter of fact, if Papa Stroll really, really was on his game, Lance would be out of there. They'd go get Colin Pinto, and there'd be him and Alonzo going into the future. Never if he was really on his game, but it'll never happen. We know that. I know. And it's just a, it's just a wish. Now, no, moving no. on to Ferrari, and they qualified way out because, you know, my guy Charles Leclerc couldn't get a lap in, and because my other guy, Carlos Sainz, uh, had a boo boo because his tires, you know, were cold and they were in the wash and he went into the wall and they still somehow pulled out a great result. And it was one of the best things I've seen Ferrari do in quite a long time. They pitted Carlos Sainz way early, like they way did. and put him on, uh, on those hard tires. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They did. No, Carlos is, is good at Matt. Carlos is very good at managing tires. Um, he did, you know, Carlos is a very solid racing driver. Uh, he's going to be a huge asset to Williams. Uh, you know, look, the, the, the Charles Carlos driver pairing is excellent. Everyone at Ferrari loves it. The people who work there love it. The fans love the pairing. I was very surprised they broke it up. Having nothing to do with Lewis. But I was quite surprised because the pairing works because often when Charles is good in one track, Carlos isn't so good. And when Carlos is really good at one track, Charles isn't. So they tend to balance each other pretty nicely. Uh, and even when they fight for position, they still hug it out after the race, which isn't the case with most driver pairings. They seem to genuinely like each other. So it, it is a good driver pairing. I am sad that he won't be wearing red, uh, but uh, he's going to. It's going to be some shock therapy to Williams, I think, when he comes and Alex is facing a world-class driver. 
uh, on the other side of the garage. Uh, but, you know, Charles did his usual excellent race. Uh, Charles is driving very, very well these days. Um, he did make a mistake uh, in the one push lap that he got in Singapore, which is why he only qualified ninth because his time was deleted. Mm -hmm. um, he went over track limits. Probably the, the, the closest call of being over track limits that I've ever seen. It was so tiny, I couldn't really see that he was over, but apparently he was. But Charles did a great race uh, to go from ninth to fifth. Um, really did a great job. Um, this is Charles did a very good job at the last race. Uh, the Ferrari is really good on street tracks. Um, you know, I think it'll be very good at Vegas. Uh, I think that's a possibility for Ferrari to win. What um, do you think for Austin? What do you think they're going to do uh, the next race? We got what three weeks off? What are you going? What do you think they're going to do? Uh, I think it's going to be a strong McLaren track. Uh, Coda. Uh, I think that's going to be a really good McLaren track. To be honest, uh, it's a, you yeah, know, you, when you said that they do have a strong driver pairing. But when you can get a world champion like Lewis to come to your team and all mm -hmm. the merchandise you're going to sell, all Correct. all the sponsors that are going to flock to Ferrari, it's going to be a madhouse. And we can't, mm -hmm. we cannot wait to see Lewis in red. And I wish, mm -hmm. and on a bigger scale, if I could like have magic dust and pixie dust and go blah, 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 and everything would be the way I want it, Carlos Science would go to Williams right now. Lewis Hamilton would go to Ferrari right now. They put Kimi Antonelli in the seat right now and all would be right in the world. Because if I see one more of this coincidence is that uh, Mercedes, I'm putting all my merch except for that one hat I got at, mm -hmm. at Silverstone. I'm putting it all on eBay and I'm putting it all into buying Ferrari. This is going on eBay? No, I have the one, the yellow one from uh, Silverstone, the 181. That's the one I got over there. Yeah. But it, it'll be interesting. Coda is a Lewis track. Uh, Jeez, Coda is a track. track. <laughs> They're both very good tracks. Uh, I've got five track days myself in Coda. Mm -hmm. I know the track really well. Uh, I've driven it, like I said, yeah, five track days, one in Porsches and four in AMGs. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a like Spa, I have three track days now at Spa. Both of them are super technical tracks. Drivers love them because it's they're both super technical. Uh, a lot of corners, uh, you know, uh, and it's very hard to put together the perfect lap at either of them. Well, we had Alex Vogel earlier in the year on the show, and he drives in GT America. And GT4 America, and if you're a racing fan, go out and check out GT4 America. Yep. Alex Vogel drives for the OnlyFans Mercedes AMG car. Mm -hmm. One, he's won a race this year, his first race win, and he got a second place just recently. And he says the most technical race or racetrack is Coda for 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 in him. America. Yeah, in America. America, he says he says that's the most technical track for uh -huh. him. He's right. And now to our last segment, yeah. Danny Rick. I there's, you know, you oh, you saw the broadcast here in a minute. You saw the broadcasters almost actually like break down when they when Danny Rick was given his interview because it was so sad, and I thought that he was done a disservice because I wanted to see him get in and do a donut, and I wanted to see the fans give him a, a good goodbye. I wanted to see them all line up where he's walking and you know, congratulate him for all he's done for Red Bull and the Red Bull family. This is a man who has eight race victories. This is a man who, if it wasn't for, remember, he beat Max Verstappen two out of the three years he was there. Remember, he beat Sebastian Vettel in his last year. Well, not in his last year, but he did beat Sebastian Vettel head, heads up. And if yeah, it Red wasn't, if, if it wasn't for the Mercedes dominance, he could have come away with two racing titles. It, it, it's a possibility. But I, he's one of the most likable drivers I've ever seen. 
He's always smiling. He's always happy. There's a, a sense of just happiness and radiance that comes from being around him. You just feel good. You know, he's feeling good. You're feeling good. He, he's the guy you want to go to the bar with. He's the guy you want to go play tennis with. He's the guy you want as your friend. And I thought that how they ushered him out was shameful. Yeah, well, look, I, I love – everyone loves Danny Rick. I mean, hey. The racing helmet that I use that you featured on the show a couple of weeks ago is a JMD design helmet. That's Danny's racing designer, and it was modeled the base design on his electric blue and silver Vegas helmet last year. Except mine is red, chrome, and black. And uh, sure enough, his last racing helmet looks very much like my current racing helmet. It just has red flakes instead of red chrome. I love Danny Rick. Everyone loves Danny Rick. Look, let's talk turkey. Danny okay. Rick has won eight races more than only four drivers on the grid have won more races than Danny Rick has won. That's it. Only for the other 15. No, he was a great racing driver. Um, age affects us all differently and driver's performance drops at different rates. Fernando is still driving like a top driver at age 42 or 43. Danny isn't. It sucks. It's unfair. I wish he were, we all wish he were, but he's not. So I had no problem on a merit basis with Red Bull exiting him and giving Liam Lawson a chance. But that's where it stops. Why they wouldn't give somebody who has done so much for the sport and so much for the team a dignified, proper public exit is a scandal and it's a stain on the way Red Bull runs that team. Red Bull, literally, everything Red Bull can do wrong in PR, it does wrong. <laughs> it does. Rick <laughs> And it it's the All yeah. Red Bull had to do was make a public announcement before Singapore. This will be Danny Rick's last race. We're bringing in Liam Lawson. We hate doing it, but on a performance basis only, we have no choice. Yes. Um, and people would understand it and respect it because it's the right decision from a racing standpoint. And that would have given Red Bull an opportunity, frankly, to do a great PR thing have a driver's, you know, honor walk to say goodbye, have yes. donuts, uh, have him do donuts and have Lewis and, and Charles and Fernando do donuts on the track, have a public announcement, have him make a speech, make, yes. a, make a sad event into a great event and a chance yes. to honor the wonderful career that Daniel Ricardo has had in Formula One. And instead, Daniel Ricardo slinked off at 146 local time alone in an empty paddock with Kim Illman, who I really like here, giving him a hug goodbye and taking a photograph because he was the only person left to say goodbye. Wow. Ridiculous, scandalous, That's and wrong. And Christian, you should be ashamed of yourself. Shame on you. Yeah. I mean, That's what I that, I mean, you, man, you laid it out. You put it the way it should be put. I mean, this guy deserved more. Yeah. He didn't deserve what he got. He didn't deserve to go out that way. And, you know, it's hard to root for Red Bull. I root for, I'm root. i rooting for Max now because I, I just don't like I don't like it when Big Brother or big corporations pick on 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 people. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Max fan just because of that. But I, I mean, I, I can't root for Red Bull. I can't. I'm more a fan of drivers than of teams, maybe because I drive a little bit myself. And as I've gotten older, like I like Ferrari, uh, but Ferrari is more a culture than anything else. I, yeah, I, totally. I, but I'm more a fan of drivers than of teams. Like I've got, I've come to like Max as I've got grown more and more respectful of his ability. Uh, you know, I, I I love Lewis. I I like Charles. I, I like a lot of drivers. Teams, they come and go. Ferrari's an institution. Most teams are a little more fungible to me, um, but I like I like drivers, and you know they change teams. But like I said, Danny Rick, I don't dis I don't hate any team. I've been to Red Bull. I was their paddock club guest this year at Montreal, but they should have done better by Danny Rick because and, Danny you know what they could do. And I hope that they rectify this by maybe having a day where they come out like remember when like in football when football players retire they just have a press conference just for that 
when they retire, you know, at, at the end of the season. And I hope they do something like that. They have a press conference, maybe in Australia with Danny Rick. Maybe they fly out uh, Sebastian Vettel and, you know, they they have a press conference for him and then he, they'll have a car out there and he can maybe do some donuts or, or do something. Some type of season. You're right. First race of next season, they do something like that. They have a driver on and walk. They do some donuts. They, they let him make a speech. Do something. Because they really got to fix it up. Because you laid it out on the line, it, it's a stain on them. And yeah, they, they on that note, we have a, is it a three week or is it a month off? It's three weeks, right? I, you know, it's three weeks to a month. It's it's a long break. I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I will tell you, maybe it's because I'm a red-blooded American. Maybe it's because I've got five track days at Coda. Coda is my yeah. favorite race of the year. The, mm-hmm. the US GP, absolutely my favorite race. What a great track. Austin is a great atmosphere. Um, it's really the only U.S. race, to be honest, where the hardcore race fans who go every year turn out. It's not about the yep. fashion show or the celebrities or the clothes. Yeah. Or race. All the other U.S. races. It's about racing. Yes. So I can't wait. I can't so wait for that either. either. And ladies and gentlemen out there, I'm having a knee surgery uh, tomorrow. So the next time you see us, we'll be talking about Scott's trip to Spa and his racing experience. And I'll probably be like having my crutches around so I can get around. But on that note, I want to thank you guys all for checking in America F1 on our Singapore review show. And Scott and I thank you for joining us today and tomorrow and whenever you watch a show from America F1. And as always, Keep on racing, everybody. Good health.